God, thank you so much for your word. Uh, even songs that remind us of what you have said is true. God, as we continue worship now and we look to your word, uh, to the preaching of your word, I pray that you would give me clarity and that you would enable our hearts to respond in obedience to what we read and hear now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, this summer, the elders gave me the opportunity to preach 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And during my preparation for that sermon, uh, some things were clarified for me personally. I picked that text because I had been wrestling with it for a long time, and I knew if I had to preach it, I'd have to answer those questions that I had put off. But as I answered those questions, things that occur in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians started to get clarified for me. And so I started to get a desire to preach 1 Thessalonians 5 as well. And so since they've given me the opportunity to preach again, today's that day. Uh, so excited to be in 1 Thessalonians 5, and I think that this will serve our body very well. When Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonian church, he intended uh, what he was writing to produce maturity in every single person in the body what he wrote was not to be disregarded or taken lightly because this already obedient and faithful church that was holding fast to what Paul had taught them, even amidst persecution and suffering, this church still needed further equipping, much like we do today. With this letter, Paul intended to further equip the Thessalonians to abound even more in the faithful obedience that they were already practicing with one another. And I think that this section, uh, 5 to 11 specifically, will have uh, quite the same effect on us as well, to increase and even help complete what might still be lacking in Grace Bible Church. As many of you know, this weekend, uh, some of the men from our body went to the Courageous Churchmen and Ecclesia conferences, and... Uh, that's always a sweet time for the teaching uh, that we get up there. Many of you aren't uh, strangers to the instruction that comes from Jupiter. Uh, but something else that's really cool that I and the other guys noticed is that you're meeting tons, tons of people all the time, new people. And when you introduce yourself, you're finding out where people are from and uh, when we tell them where we're from, people want to know, oh, you're at Scott Maxwell's church? Or, oh, you're at Smedley's church? Uh, and people just really have an esteem uh, for Grace Bible Church, what they know is happening here, uh, the endurance through suffering that's happened uh, in the past, as well as the training ministries that are here. And so uh, that's always exciting. Um, Really, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, churches look at us as, as a model church. Uh, somebody asked me who we had lunch with, what is Grace Bible Church like? And I said, well, just imagine the best church in the world. <laughs> there you go. We're not perfect, but it is, it is a blessing to be at this church. Uh, and, and similar to what was happen happening in Thessalonica, they were obedient. They were applying what they had been taught. There was love. Uh, encouragement, admonishment, uh, strengthening happening among that church, just like it happens here. Uh, I want to start off just reading uh, from verse 13 in chapter 4. And so we'll see that we have much to benefit from what was written to the Thessalonians as well. So we'll read from 4.13 all the way through to 5.11. God says through the apostle Paul, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, as to the times and epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come, just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, again, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you also are doing. As we just read in 4, 13, Paul wants to put an end to the Thessalonians' hopeless grief. Paul ended the hopeless grief that was happening in the Thessalonian church by doing several things. Number one, and this is just by way of review, he first did this by revealing the resurrection priority. Revealing the resurrection priority. In Acts 17, 1 to 9, you can read about Paul's account of his time in Thessalonica. He was there for three Sabbaths, maybe a little bit longer as possible. But even with that, he wasn't there any great length of time. And Luke records that as Paul was reasoning in the synagogue before the Jews forced him to leave town because of their persecution, it says some of the Jews were persuaded, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and also not a few of the leading women. So something of a, a small revival happened in Thessalonica when Paul went on his missionary journey. So if you turn back actually to chapter 1 in 1 Thessalonians, you can see in verses 9 and 10 what Paul was saying, must have been saying, while he was in Thessalonica for at least those three Sabbaths. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 say, For they themselves, that is the churches in surrounding areas, Macedonia and Achaia specifically, they report about us what kind of reception we had among you and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. The Thessalonians' repentance was so thorough, it was so well known that churches in the surrounding area were able to report to Paul the effect that his preaching had when he was in Thessalonica, even though he's not there any longer. Paul's preaching in Thessalonica trained the disciples there, even in that short period of time, to do at least a couple things. Do you see them? In verses 9 and 10, when he preached repentance, they, they repented, they turned to God from idols to do what? Serve a living and true God and also not only to serve a living and true God, but also to wait for his son from heaven. Those were the two effects, at least, that Paul's preaching had on the Thessalonians while he was there. Now, again, by way of review, you remember the, the church was doing this together. It was together that they had heard Paul's preaching. It was together that they had repented. It was together that they began to serve 
the living and true God, and it was together, all together, that they began to wait for Jesus to come from heaven. Verse 10 tells us what they were waiting for Jesus to do. At the end of verse 10, that last phrase there when it says, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. This is very important context for where we're going in in chapter uh, 5. This verse that talks about Jesus, the one who died, who rescues believers from the wrath to come, it often gets incorrectly used as a gospel passage to mean Jesus Christ will one day come from heaven. He's the same one who died for sinners and rescued them from the eternal wrath of God. Is that true? Absolutely. That is the gospel, that Jesus bore sins he didn't commit, He endured wrath from God that he did not deserve for sinners who believe and repent before he rose again. He's one day coming again. The gospel says that. But this verse is not a passage about the gospel in verse 10. Notice, if you look again, it says that it makes note that Jesus is the one who died, right? Same Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. That's future, isn't it? The wrath to come. The wrath being described here is not God's eternal wrath that he pours out on sinners in hell or in the lake of fire, but this is a wrath that is coming. That that word is really crucial to, to our passages. A wrath to come or coming. And the better we understand what Paul is saying here at the beginning of this book, we'll get what he's saying at the end. And so I want to spend a little bit of time developing uh, coming, what it means for this wrath to be coming. If we get this, then, then the, the rest should come pretty easy, easily. He uses this word coming, the term coming or come, multiple times in the book. And each time he, uh, he uses this word in this way, it simply means the arrival of something or someone, from one place into another different geographical location. Does that make sense? To come, he's referring to a person or a thing moving from one place to a different geographical location. That'll be uh, important, as we'll see in a second. Uh, Let's just look at a couple more of these uses. Look at the the very next verse, chapter 2, verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Our coming to you. Obviously, Paul's referring to when he came. He left one place, came into Thessalonica. That's easy, right? Look at verse 18 in the same chapter, 218. For we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Again, This is him referring to himself desiring to move from his current location where he was held up. Apparently, Satan prevented Paul from traveling back geographically to the city of Thessalonica to pour into the church there. In uh, 2.19, the very next verse, it's another reference to the Lord coming from heaven. And then again in 3.6, the term coming is used again this time in reference to Timothy. He says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought to us good news, so on and so forth. Here's Tim, he's referring to Timothy. They, they couldn't take it. They didn't know what happened to the Thessalonians. They got run out of town by the persecutors. They're concerned about the church. He's got this burden. When it became too much, he said, Timothy, leave Silas and me and go check on the Thessalonian church. Timothy did that. Here it is. He's referring to himself as as Timothy as being back. Timothy has come to us from you. Simple, right? Timothy left Thessalonica after he went and came back to Paul. He reported, and now Paul's going to write a letter. So that's the the way coming is used. Uh, Interesting to note that the coming of Jesus is mentioned every single chapter in Thessalonians. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, in the very last verse, uh, verses of those chapters, and then it's detailed clearly in what we just read in chapter 4, and then it's mentioned again in chapter 5. So this idea of Jesus coming is central to the book, 
and the term, whenever it's used in this way, always means traveling from one place, again, to another place. So in each of the instances that we looked at, that's what's being spoken of is a relocation. That's the point. Why is that important for 110? Well, it's important because we're making the point that this isn't the hell. hell. This isn't hellfire, right? That hell's never said to be coming to earth. Listen at these references. You don't have to flip there. But just listen at these references to the way Jesus speaks about hell. Matthew 5, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the, hell, the fiery hell. Matthew 5, 29, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. The next verse, 530 in Matthew, if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And then a couple more, Luke 12, 5. But I will warn you, Jesus says, whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And apparently Peter was listening closely. He says in 2 Peter chapter 2, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and then he goes on, what's the point? Here we're talking about two different types of wrath. One is a coming wrath. The other is wrath poured out on sinners in hell. And if you you heard, the difference between the two is that one comes to people and the other, people go to it. Does that make sense? The coming wrath spoken about in 1 Thessalonians is a wrath being relocated from God to earth. When the Bible speaks about people going to hell, God sends people there, not there to people. Okay, so just to, I know we're belaboring the point a little bit, but the wrath spoken of here is coming to earth, not the other way around. So there is a time Paul told post-crucifixion, post-resurrection, When he was speaking to a New Testament church, he taught them to wait for Jesus to rescue them from a wrath that was yet future that was coming to earth. One day, one day, God will unleash his wrath on the earth in a way that that hasn't yet been seen is the point. Wrath is coming from God. Grace Bible Church, wrath is coming from God. This isn't even entirely a a New Testament idea. Uh, We'll get to that in a second. But this was Paul's first way of ending hopeless grief among the Thessalonians is is by revealing the resurrection priority. So jump back to chapter 4. The, first, the Thessalonian church is uninformed about what's going to happen to the people who died, who were waiting with them on the Lord to rescue them from this coming wrath. And so to end their grief as if they don't have that hope, what happens to the people who have died? He assures them that they actually will not miss the hope that they were waiting for. So he assures them of this by saying not only will they be resurrected and then witness what they were waiting for, Jesus descending to rescue them, but he says that they'll do this first. They'll do this first. In verse 16, the dead in Christ will rise first. Not only won't they miss it, they'll, or not only will they not miss 
Jesus coming. They'll see Jesus when he comes before you people who are still alive is the point. That was the first way he ended hopeless grief in the Thessalonian church. The second way that Paul did this was by relaying the coming reunion. Relaying the coming reunion in verse 17 of chapter 4. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Your friends who you miss, who you were waiting on Jesus to come rescue you with, they'll see Jesus first, and don't worry, you'll also go and see Jesus and them. So he revealed the resurrection priority. Number two, relayed the coming reunion. And thirdly, the way Paul ended hopeless grief in the Thessalonian church was by requiring their mutual participation. In verse 18, we see this. After Paul gave all of these details about the Lord's coming, coming in the clouds, there's going to be a trumpet, voice of an archangel. This is going to be a verifiable event, if you will. Verse 18, he tells them, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Since you know now how it's going to take place, now you care for one another by tell, you, taking the words I've just given you, and now you communicate them to one another. <clears throat> and so with those three things, Paul still is not done with where we started in verse 13 of chapter 4. He still wants to drive this home and end the hopeless grief that the Thessalonian church was, was experiencing. The fourth way that he does that, now getting into our passage, is recalling their previous knowledge. Recalling their previous knowledge. He does this in verse 1 of chapter 5. I've just told you about the coming of the Lord. Now he transitions and says, Now, as to the times and epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. The assumption seems to be that as Paul is passing the baton of encouragement off to the Thessalonian church, as they're using Paul's words to encourage one another with these details that he's just given them, Paul actually gets out ahead, uh, gets out in front of a question they might have is, when's this going to happen? When's this going to take place? And what, the way Paul does that is he says, listen, you don't need to know, you don't need to have me write to you about the times and epics. And he gives a reason in verse 2 why they don't need times, seasons, uh, when this will happen. The reason is in verse 2, because, or 4, you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. They already knew about coming wrath. We saw that in one ten. They already knew about coming wrath. And here Paul calls that coming wrath by its Old Testament name, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Spoken about by the Old Testament prophets. There's a time coming uh, of tribulation and wrath on the world. And Paul calls it the day of the Lord. And he says the reason you don't need to know times or seasons about this rescue you're going to experience is because the day of the Lord, to follow, is unknown. It comes like a thief in the night. So if you don't need to know the event from which you're rescued, if there's no signs for the, for the, the event itself, then you don't need to know when you're going to be rescued. You don't need me to write and tell you those things. And notice in verse 3 that this destructive day of the Lord's wrath that's coming upon the earth, for whom this wrath is coming. Verse 3 says, while they are saying, you notice the pronoun change? He's been talking about you, 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 you. And then when he talks about the day of the Lord, he says, they while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. There's the, you don't know when it's coming. 
So it's a sudden destruction that comes not upon the Thessalonians, because, of course, we've said they've been rescued from this time. They're gone when the Lord has taken them. But the destruction comes upon them, unbelievers. The day of the Lord is for those who are in darkness, according to verse 4. And it, and it comes like uh, pains upon a woman with child. Uh, all the moms in the room get that, right? It's a sudden, painful, uh, debilitating pain that comes upon uh, people who are unaware of it. And it says, but you, verse 4, but you are not in darkness. The next thing that Paul does in this passage as he's seeking to assure them of hope, of in the hopeless grief that's happening in Thessalonica, is number five, reaffirm their distinct sonship. Reaffirm the Thessalonians' distinct sonship. Verse four says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness like the them that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. He's contrasting the brethren, those who have, uh, the brethren with those who will be overtaken and destroyed on the day of the Lord. What distinguishes believers from those who will be overtaken by that day is that they have a different, distinct sonship from those who will be overtaken by that day. They're called sons of the day, sons of light and sons of day in verse 5. Uh, this, is, this darkness is represented of moral depravity, spiritual blindness, and Paul is saying, you're not that. You don't practice immorality. You, you practice repentance. You're not spiritually blind but you have been enlightened. Those who do practice immorality are of the night of the darkness. Those who are spiritually blind and fail to see the day of the Lord come, or the day of the Lord that's coming with that wrath, they are the ones who are unbelievers who will be caught off guard. Uh, the immorality that takes place in the world among unbelievers actually perfectly positions them under the wrath of God to endure it when it comes. When's the last time you communicated to someone that the wrath of God was coming? The wrath of God is coming. Notice, by the way, when they say this. Uh, look, at, look back at verse 3. When, when do unbelievers say peace and safety? That's an interesting uh, insertion there, that, that they say those things. Why would they say that? What's the, what's, what's the deal with peace and safety? Why, what would cause the unbelieving world to say peace and safety? It actually seems that this is a response apparently, to what Paul and, by virtue of Paul, the Thessalonian believers must have been telling the unbelieving world, the wrath of God is coming. And those who don't believe that contradict that statement and say, no, no wrath, peace, safety. The wrath of God is not coming. And they persist in their unbelief. By the way, this isn't a New Testament idea that wrath comes upon unbelievers who persist in rebellion against God. Uh, flip back to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs 1. Solomon personified the wisdom of God in verse 20 on, on down. And he describes the wisdom of God as, as crying out aloud in the streets, raising her voice in the marketplaces, crying out 
at the head of the noisy street, at the entrance of the city gate speaking. And God's wisdom, according to verse 23, is preaching the same thing that Paul preached when he went to the Thessalonians. Look at verse 23. If you turn at my reproof, if you turn, that's repentance language, to turn. The wisdom of God preaching repentance admonishes sinners, fools, uh, the simple ones, the scoffers, the fools, to repent and look at the result of their unrepentance. We'll start in verse 24. God's wisdom says, because I have called out, or because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then you will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yahweh. Would have none of my counsel and despise all my reproof. Therefore, verse 31, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. Same, similar word as we find in our passage, destruction comes upon them. And then it ends with these words, verse 33, but whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Ease and security. The world is saying, peace, and safety, but it's those who heed God's wisdom that are actually at peace, at ease, who are secure, who are safe from coming wrath. Do you see? This is also how John the Baptist, if we fast forward a little bit to the last Old Testament prophet, this is how he preached the gospel, right? Flee from the wrath to come. How do I do that, John? Repent and be baptized. Right? There's this idea woven throughout Scripture that unbelievers will experience wrath. Now, that day has been a long way off, hasn't it? The patience of God has been taken advantage of and presumed upon, but that day is still coming. And so our message must be, wrath is coming. Repent. Believe. If there is anyone here today who has taken the patience of God for granted, who continues to persist in immorality and unbelief and unrepentance, you, friend, must repent. There is wrath coming up on this world like we haven't seen before. If you want to read about it, Revelation 5 to 19 details the coming wrath that God will unleash in the tribulation on this world. The way to escape from it is to flee to Christ. Do what the Thessalonians did. Believe the gospel to serve a living and true God and to wait for, for the Son from heaven who rescues from wrath. That's the way to flee wrath. The, the sixth way that Paul ended hopeless grief in the Thessalonian church was by requesting a fortifying sobriety. Requesting a fortifying sobriety. He has given them just a mouthful of details. In 4, all the way up to verse 5, and now he actually calls them to live in keeping with their identity. To live in keeping with their identity. Look at verse 6. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. Immorality takes place among the sons of night, those who are in darkness. 
But since we are of the day, let us be sober. Complete contrast. Let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. So he details how he intends this sobriety, this fortifying, protective, if you will, sobriety to take place. When he says in verse 8, we're of the day, but let us be sober. And then he says how to accomplish that. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. We see these qualities uh, in other places in Scripture, faith, hope, love, uh, together. But the context is really what determines the meaning of the words. What purpose are these words serving in this context? How would faith, love, and hope have a fortifying influence on the Thessalonians? Well, here's a hint. Uh, at the end of verse 8, there's some indication. Hope gets, a, uh, gets an object. Hope of what? That last quality, hope of salvation. Hope of salvation. And again, sticking with the context, uh, we've already talked about the salvation that's in view, right? The salvation isn't the, the salvation that took place at the cross when God rescued sinners from God's eternal wrath from hell. But this salvation, again, is reference to the salvation that takes place when Jesus descends from heaven and removes the church from the wrath that's coming. That's the salvation. And so when he says the hope of salvation, he's specifically referring to uh, an eager anticipation for being rescued from that coming wrath. <laughs> Rejoice in all the truths of being saved by the cross from God's eternal wrath in hell and the lake of fire, and add this one, add this salvation, <laughs> being rescued from the coming wrath that will be unleashed on the world. And so I think that it's best to take faith, love, and hope, all three, as a reference to that salvation. If the Thessalonians were to hope in that rescue that Jesus will accomplish for them when he comes, then they would be led to sobriety now while they live. With this salvation as the object of, of hope, if we take it for, for the rest of the, the ones in that list, faith and, and love, essentially what Paul is saying, believe that that coming rescue is certain. Have, have faith. Put on faith in that rescue as a breastplate. And not only that, not only believe it, but love it. Don't just say, yeah, I think that's true. But love it. Desire it. Yearn for it. Faith, love, and hope as it regards the salvation that you will be afforded on that day. If we did this, just think about if you lived with, with faith and love as a breastplate on and hope as a helmet on every day of your life, the sobriety that will come, how you would live, how it would impact us as we await the return of Jesus we would be a much holier people, probably, certainly. We would be holier because we would be anticipating him coming at any moment for us. Blessed is the servant who's found faithful when his master returns. And we would also live with a sense of sobriety, not only among one another, but towards unbelievers. If we believed that we wouldn't be here when the wrath of God came to be unleashed on the world, we would preach like we might not be here when the wrath of God came to be unleashed on the world. We would preach the gospel. It's amazing as I think about, you know, time that I have during the week, I can get so absorbed 
in what I have going on, in my responsibilities, tasks that I need to accomplish, I can go to the grocery store, pass dozens of people currently under the wrath of God, the clerk check at, at checkout, or maybe I just don't care and I skip the, church, the clerk and go to self-checkout because that's faster. I'm not like really worried about a gospel opportunity. <laughs> and we just don't give any thought to, man, what if, what if I leave this place, Jesus comes, then who's going to preach the gospel? We should live with a sense of that kind of sobriety among unbelievers and among one another. And when he, when he instructs us to the faith, love, and hope that we should have regarding the salvation, make no mistake, this isn't because I know I'm, I know I'm good, I know I'm in, I know I'm going to persevere. Look at verse 9. What's the confidence founded on? He gives us a reason. Where should your confidence come from? Because God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The confidence comes from what God has determined for us. This doesn't make us proud people. I'm, I'm not going to see the wrath. This make us, makes us a humble people. Oh, God, you haven't destined me for wrath? I won't see wrath? As foolish as I was in my unrepentance, you haven't destined me for that? Thank you. And then again, verse 10, this is Jesus who died for us so that whether we are awake, meaning whether we are alive and remain when he returns, or whether we're asleep, those who have died in Christ, it doesn't matter whether you die before Jesus comes or you're alive and you remain when he comes. He died for what purpose? So that we will live together with him Wow, oh glorious day. We will live with him. That is why Jesus died. The final way that Paul intends to end hopeless grief in the Thessalonian church is exactly how he, how he ended the last section in chapter 4. So number 7, Paul ended hopeless grief in the Thessalonian church by number 7 repeating his prior instruction repeating his prior instruction. It's a simple way to close this section of Scripture, but it's a necessary and wise way to conclude. Paul here is for the second time entrusting the ongoing shepherding care of the church to the church. It wasn't, this, this section that we're looking at has to do with uh, what theologians call eschatology, the study or theology of the end times, eschatology. But who's entrusted with the responsibility of knowing these things and not only knowing them, but knowing them so well, being so familiar that you can encourage and comfort other people with it? It's the church, every single member. Look at, look at verse 27 in chapter 5. I just think this is interesting. Paul says, I adjure you. He puts them under an oath of sorts. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. He doesn't close all his epistles like that. But he is adamant, not only that they tell one another this section, make sure everybody reads or hears from this letter. If somebody missed Sunday when this got there, read it again. <laughs> make sure they know what's here. And so we, to be further equipped like the Thessalonians were by this section, Grace Bible Church needs to be further equipped by these realities. Can you comfort people? Are you skilled enough in your encouragement to comfort them with these details? We should be. I heard somebody, uh, a preacher recently say that the convictions you don't develop now will be the ones you don't have when you need them. Right? Right? The convictions you don't develop now will be the ones you don't have when you need them. We live in a time where eschatology is, ah, you know, I'm going to 
I'm going to pan something. It'll all pan out in the end. Pan, uh, Paul wasn't a pan anything, right? He didn't, it, it, it mattered to him, the details. And it should matter to us, the details. If we aren't able, if we aren't equipped, skilled enough to encourage one another with these words, we're probably not skilled enough to communicate these to our own heart when we need them. And our, our brother or sister in Christ when they need to hear them. And if we don't agree or know these details, then how can we put on the faith, love, and hope in these realities that Paul instructed us? We're missing out. And so we miss the fortifying sobriety as well as encouragement afforded by a passage like this. God is is so kind to give us these details. Uh, If this is perhaps new to you, uh, then I encourage you, continue uh, reading this passage. Continue sorting out the details until it's clarified in your mind. Uh, Songs are a good way to fortify uh, and establish truth in our hearts. And so we're going to close on O Glorious Day. O Glorious Day. And so as you sing these lyrics, and even hear those around you singing, meditate on these details, the way it's going to happen, and let that sober you and and fortify you and establish you as you think about these realities. Let's pray. God, you are kind to us in, in ways that we don't, realize or have the words to describe. Thank you for uh, choosing to condescend and speak to us despite our rebellion. Uh, Thank you for saving us. Thank you for sending Christ to save us. And God, thank you for being willing to send him again to come to save us, to rescue us from coming wrath. God, I pray we would believe these things. I pray that we would be eager to believe them for ourselves, to encourage one another with these words, as this passage says. And God, I pray also for those who we will meet who do not believe these things, who are under your wrath, who are awaiting the fearful day of the Lord, that you would give us a spirit of boldness, and compassion on unbelievers. Help us as we sing now to rejoice in this truth. Amen.